Meet Squirt and Weenie, and their proud mum, Clinky. They belong to one of the most famous families on the planet. True celebrities and a global phenomenon. They're part of a dynasty that has led to hours of television, films, and even their own fan club. I love them so much because they are full of love in their daily life. Behind this popularity lies a truly remarkable 20-year field study. A groundbreaking project started by a scientist who wanted to find out what meerkats can teach us about cooperation. It's taken two decades and some remarkable experiments to unravel the mysteries of their complex lives. Enabling us to understand and appreciate the challenges facing the likes of Pinky and her celebrated clan. These people are in love. They've traveled thousands of miles to be here in the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa. As soon as the TV series Meerkat Manor was broadcast in 2005, the meerkats were catapulted to international stardom. I love the meerkats. I love to be around them, work with them, and, you know, watch what they do every day. I do believe they have characters and personality. It's interesting to people who are not researchers, but who just love the animals. They cooperate together, work as a team, and just like a human family. Some members of the Appreciation Society have gone to remarkable lengths to express their affection. The first pen I pen actually is Flower. She is a superstar. I believe most of the people know her. Yeah, and she's my favorite. The second one I pen, she's Mozart. Unfortunately, she cannot have a good family, so I pen her in the heaven with her boyfriend, and finally they have a kid together to form a really good and happy family. No one can doubt that meerkats have become truly global celebrities. And now, in the Kalahari, there are a new set of stars in the making. This is the Kung Fu clan. A 30-strong group of meerkats. One female rules a meerkat clan, and in charge of the Kung Fu is eight-year-old Clinky. Her loyal partner is Ningaloo. He and Clinky have been together for most of their lives. They have a powerful bond. It's the beginning of the dry season. Baking days are followed by freezing nights. In the early morning light, they stretch out and warm up their frozen bones. The 30 strong members of the Kung Fu are made up of Clinkers and Ningaloo's sons and daughters. And there are more on the way. Clinky is pregnant. Her next litter of pups is due in just six weeks. She'll need plenty of help to raise her youngsters in the unforgiving dry season. But needs must and the group will soon set out and see what they can dig out of the sand.
At the Meerkat Project Base, the core team of graduate volunteers are getting ready for a new day. They are at the heart of what has grown into one of the most comprehensive studies of animal behavior ever undertaken. It's a highly organized operation with PhD students and visiting professors and a core team of 12 volunteer researchers. They're sitting out into the desert to find, record, and weigh members of the 18 meerkat groups, which are dispersed over 39 square miles. The researchers are careful that any interaction they have with the meerkats affects their behavior as little as possible. The team must let the animals get on with their lives. Even so, it's hard not to get attached. Don't worry, come on. You try to be, of course, scientific and not get involved with them, but no, of course, they have different personalities, and that's the amazing thing of meerkats. And they're humanizing them to a certain point. Oh, it's a kind of a pinch yourself kind of moment that I'm actually doing this. <laughs> I feel very lucky. Come on. How'd you get? None of this would have existed without the work of Cambridge zoologist Professor Tim Clutton Brock, a world authority on animal behavior. Since 1993, he's been at the helm of the Kalahari Meerkat Project. His mission in this study is to discover exactly what makes the meerkat the most cooperative mammal on Earth. This walking home with the group in front of you Walking back in the evening always seems like an enormous privilege. <laughs> Tim had been searching for the right animal to study for quite a while, and it was a television program that first sparked his interest in meerkats. No bigger than the tassel on a lion's tail, a meerkat stands tall. I saw a film called Meerkats United, and I realized that meerkats were exactly what I was looking for. A really cooperative mammal, where I could learn to recognize individuals and see exactly what everyone was doing. He was hooked. So I headed off to the Kalahari, and my life changed. <laughs> Life is also about to change for the Kung Fu clan. Before Clinky leads the group out to forage, there's a problem to be dealt with. Her family are on edge. Even partner Lingaloo stays out of the way. Pregnant Clinky is on the warpath. Clinky spots her daughter, Mrs. McGee. She has decided that her days in the group are numbered. Mrs. McGee is about to be banished. She tries to protect herself by being submissive to her mother. It's not going to help. Clinky bites her viciously. Mrs. McGee is not wanted. Clinky is merciless. Two more daughters get the same treatment. Daddy. 
Clinky is banishing into exile any daughters who are or could become pregnant. But then she spots something. Bibi, the weakest of these daughters, is trying not to be noticed. She almost gets away with it. Pinky wants to make sure the group raises just one set of offspring, her own. They're all fighting for limited resources. Any competition would put Pinky's pups under threat. She won't let that happen. Tinky has driven four of her daughters out of the family. They watch forlornly from a safe distance. Life for them in exile is going to be tough. However brutal this seems, Tinky is prepared to go much further to protect her unborn pups if she needs to. Kuttenbrock's decision to work with Meerkats led him here to the Southern Kalahari in 1993. Eventually, he and his team discovered an empty farm on the border between South Africa and Botswana. In this desolate environment, he saw at first hand how Meerkats could be the perfect mammal to study if you could get close to them. The environment's so open, when I saw them I thought, wow, here you can really see everything that they're doing. And if only it were possible to habituate several different groups, then we could really get on top of answering important questions about them. Habituation is the process of getting an animal to become so completely unafraid of you that you're ignored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If Tim could manage this, he could get close enough to study them without the meerkats minding. Meerkats don't make friends with strangers easily, and there are no shortcuts when it comes to breaking into their world. It would take the team years of walking amongst the meerkats in the bush, always announcing themselves with a gentle hum. <laughs> I can still see them in the distance, and they're not actually running away yet, but they're gradually moving off. And if I kept pressing them, they would run quickly. So what I'm trying to do is to tell them that it's me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're not... I'm not trying to hide from them at all. After thousands of hours of hard graft, they could now get to within a few feet of a number of meerkat families. Mm -hmm. It was a remarkable achievement. Now the work could begin. If the meerkats were truly cooperating, each individual member of the group would be doing better than if they were living on their own. To test this theory, Tim needed to measure the costs and benefits of them helping each other by measuring if they were gaining or losing weight. How was he to get the meerkats to agree to that? He began by trying to lure them with every food he could think of. Anything that might tickle a meerkat's taste buds. Mealworms, chicken, peanut butter, condensed milk. We tried everything we could find to see if they would eat it. but they weren't interested at all. Despite Tim's best culinary efforts, the meerkats turned up their noses at everything. The team had noticed that there was one food that they would go all out to get hold of. Plover's eggs. It led them to try something new. For plover's eggs, Tim tried hen's eggs. We thought we'd see whether they were interested in the contents of eggs. But what we found out was that they weren't in the slightest bit interested. But then Tim 
saw meerkats devouring a hen's egg that had cooked in the sun. In the end, our lives changed totally when we discovered this. After two years of valiant failures, this was a eureka moment. Crumbs of boiled egg don't change the meerkat's behavior in the wild, but they do make them cooperative. This discovery was the kickstart the Kalahari meerkat project needed. More researchers began to join Tim on his project. Now they could begin to gather proper data on the meerkats. When working with a group, they would weigh an individual three times a day. When they get up, at midday, and just before they went to sleep. With radio collars, they would never be lost. All the individuals were given their own codes and computer files. And names. Now Tim could start to find answers to his big questions. Why does a meerkat actually want to live in a group? Why do they help each other out? And when they do, how do they know what job to do? The study could now get underway, all because of the meerkat's love of a tiny snack. At the Kung Fu, with the threatening females out of the way, Clinky leads her group into the increasingly dry and unforgiving bush. On the surface, there's little for them here in this ancient desert. But Clinky is an experienced hunter. If they dig through enough sand, they'll find sufficient grubs and scorpions to feed them all for the day. However, the Kung Fu aren't simply predators, they're also prey. There is a real danger of death descending from the skies. But meerkats have an early warning system. The Sentinel. Their job is to keep a lookout so the rest of the Kung Fu can keep their eyes down and focused on finding food. When Tim first came across the meerkat sentinel, he was fascinated. With his trusty boiled egg, he investigated how devoted they were to their task. I'm going to show you something that I tried 20 years ago to show this. I'm going to offer this guy some of his favorite food, some egg. The meerkat has a job to do and won't be swayed. He's on duty, he's watching for predators, and his mind is obviously fixed on that. He's just not interested in other things. It's vital for meerkats to have a fully focused sentinel on guard at all times. Foraging meerkats glance up at the sentinel occasionally to check it's still there. They quickly notice if no one appears to be on duty. Tim is recreating an experiment to show this. Very slowly. Very slowly. Go in there. And we're now going to block their view of the sentinel so they can't actually see whether the sentinel's on duty. From the group's point of view, it looks as though the sentinel has vanished. They're concerned and will react. There's someone over there now who's going up on Sentinel duty to replace him. 
individuals put themselves up for sentinel duty, usually after they've had a good meal. Tim proved this by feeding individuals with extra hard-boiled egg. As a result, they were happy to spend longer on watch. Sentinels look up at the sky for threats, but they'll also spot danger closer to the ground. And working as a group, they can together intimidate many of the most dangerous animals here. Even a predator that can kill them, such as a cobra. They stay just out of striking distance. And eventually the cobra feels outnumbered. Cooperation is at the heart of what they do. Every member of the family has an important role to play. So why does the dominant female throw out some important members, such as her daughters? The dry season is beginning to bite, and the Kung Fu females, driven out by Clinky, are desperate. They hang around on the fringes, perhaps hoping that Clinky might tolerate their return. But she has no intention of doing so. The evictees are stressed. Over the last few days, they've lost weight. As a small group, there are too few of them for one to act as a sentinel. When they're out foraging, they're vulnerable to being picked off by predators. But Clinky is tough. She pulls together the rest of her group who are under her spell. There's no room for sympathy. To chase away the daughters, the Kung Fu war dance in a fearsome display of solidarity. The outcasts scurry away into the desert, driven back into exile. As Tim's volume of data increased, so the natural order behind the meerkat's apparently brutal behavior began to reveal itself. Dominant females evict their daughters when they reach breeding age, around three years old. Females that enforce this system can rear up to 80 pups over the course of their lives. And a big group equals strength when defending your territory. The lengths to which a dominant female will go to control her daughters and retain her power knows no bounds. It's dusk at the Kung Fu Burrow. After a long day, the chance for the family to groom and bond. Their attention has been grabbed by intruders. Clinky's outcasts still haven't given up. They're now trying to find a way back under cover of twilight. has caught them.
tribe join together and war dance towards the outcasts to deter them. <laughs> Once more, Clinky's daughters will have to find somewhere else to spend the night. Clinky has driven them out to put them under pressure, especially those that may be pregnant. The stress of survival outside the group means evicted daughters will often give birth to their pups prematurely. If Clinky chances upon any live-born young, she will kill them. Infanticide. However brutal this seems, Clinky knows that if any of her daughters continued their pregnancies, they might try to kill her own pups, so it pays to be aggressive. In future, her daughters will be of use to her, but for now, they're nothing but a threat. Ten years in, Tim and his team had increased the number of habituated meerkat groups to 15, and they had monitored the complete life history of nearly a thousand individuals. A community in the desert had become a hub of world-class scientific activity. The study branched out into new areas involving scientists who had worked here as students. They started to tackle questions based on Tim's previous research. One of the first things he had noticed was that meerkats talked to each other all the time, making a huge range of calls. And that raised questions about what they were saying to each other and what the calls meant. <laughs> Professor Marta Mansa is a research biologist at Zurich University. She was Tim's first PhD student on the project. She set about investigating meerkat communication with a series of ingenious experiments. We had the calcul here behind the bush. Props are set up before the meerkats emerge from their sleeping burrows. try to do a presentation of a jackal. That's the main predator, really, of the meerkats here in the Kalahari. And as it approaches, everybody will probably become exciting, and hopefully we will we'll hear the different alarm calls. Okay, maybe you can pull slowly. Live predators would be difficult to use, so instead, Marta chose the next best thing. Alarm call. She recorded their alarm calls and discovered the meerkats had developed a series of call types, a kind of language, to warn the others of how close a predator is. And what type it is. Stop for a second and then try to move a little faster. As the jackal gets closer, the meerkats identify the ground predator and prepare for an emergency. Marta spent several months presenting various predators to see if the calls were different. She even launched a jackal into the air to see if meerkat calls distinguish between ground and aerial predators. The results of that experiment were inconclusive, but her other revelations to date have been remarkable. Uh, such a sophisticated alarm call system as in the meerkats has hardly been described in any other species. Meerkats have evolved a complex warning system. The sounds they make to warn of aerial or terrestrial predators change as the threat grows closer. So first moving animal call and now we already have the low urgency call. And now it changes into the high urgency. 
and finally they start to bark. Marta and her colleagues have discovered that the meerkats are speaking with a complex repertoire of calls. The messages they send each other are distinct and the meaning is very clear. Play them your choice of recording and you can predict exactly how they will react. <laughs> This sound means bird of prey approaching fast. It's quiet at the burrow. Clinky has not surfaced. Soon it's clear why. Clinky has given birth to her precious pups, Squirt and Weenie. They have been underground for 14 days, and today they emerge into the sunshine for the first time. Their eyes have only just opened. In front of them is their first view of their new home. The harsh but beautiful Kalahari. grown in other ways too. Three days after the pups were born, Clinky allowed her evicted daughters back into the group. Now that she's had her pups, the females are no longer a threat. Quite the opposite. They're put to work straight away as babysitters to Squirt and Weenie. These females are often able to provide milk, so, as well as keeping a lookout, they suckle the new pups. In return, they enjoy the safety of being part of a big group once more. They take 12-hour shifts and are so dedicated to the job, they won't leave the pups for a minute, even if they're starving. But the calm is soon shattered. Clinky has spotted something suspicious. The family leaps into action. Everyone has a role. The babysitters move quickly to protect the pups. Her daughters are useful now, but they've brought trouble in their wake. Three roving males from a rival group are looking to mate with Clinky's daughters. These are unwelcome visitors. If they break into the group, they could even try to overthrow her partner, Ningaloo, and disrupt the Kung Fu. Clinky's pups would be at their mercy. The stakes couldn't be higher. Clinky is on the offensive, backed up by Ningaloo. The rest of the family follow. The males slink away. For now, the Kung Fu has dealt with the threat. But the roving males could be back at any time. The meerkats are so comfortable having observers around that simply by being amongst them, the team can discover the most remarkable things. Unlike the females, male meerkats begin to leave their families when they are three years old. They can't mate with their sisters. At this time, they visit other groups, and Tim has always wanted to understand how these roving males get on. The rover has got his eye on a female from a rival group. 
It's a risky business. He's been chased repeatedly by the males from this group, and if they can catch him, there's a danger they'll kill him. So rovers that get too close and get caught by the opposition not uncommonly get killed. So they're quite jumpy. And as you can see, they're a bit careful about being seen. So they tend to go creepy crawly and then look out all the time. But he's absolutely not thinking of feeding. His mind's on sex. Roving males are so overcome with lust that they rarely stop to eat. They can spend days at a time chasing the object of their desire. But it's a risk worth taking. He'll just stay on the edge and he'll keep coming and keep going again. And he'll try and get access to one of the females behind a bush. This rover has pushed his luck too far and has disturbed a male foraging on the edge of the group. His cover is blown. Oh look, here the group is in war dance, so the group are now actually taking this seriously. And instead of one male chasing him, the whole group are now chasing him. To a meerkat, a whole group war dancing at you is extremely intimidating and uh, it's not difficult to understand why he keeps his distance when the whole group have their eyes on him. A dominant male's only chance of breeding is to leave his own group and either join or found another one with unrelated females. The chances of success are slim, but a male meerkat has to make a go of it if his particular genetic line isn't to die out. A storm, swollen with rain, passes overhead. It should signal the end of the dry season and bring the first rains of the year. By night, a huge electrical storm threatens. the clouds haven't let go of their rain. As the temperature rises, a drought is imminent. The Kung Fu are still waiting for the rains to arrive. Pups Squirt and Weenie are now six weeks old and fully weaned. They need to find solid food somewhere in this bone-dry desert. They accompany their family on foraging trips, but they're still too young to catch their own food. They make endless begging calls, but their parents, Clinky and Ningaloo, don't respond. They're not being ignored. In the newly restored family, there are 25 other meerkats available to help. The subordinate helpers give away up to half the food they catch. They look after the pups' needs as much as their own. But Squirt and Weenie won't always get this much help. Over the next two months, they will have to learn to feed themselves. A 
As Tim's project grew in size, the researchers who joined the team were rapidly moving into new areas. It was clear that a complex form of cooperation is at the heart of the meerkat family. Now some of the scientists wanted to look at things like innovation, learning and tradition. Over the last 10 years, Dr. Alex Thornton has designed a series of tests to try and find out how information spreads through meerkat societies and how they innovate. We designed a series of innovation tasks to look at which individuals and groups would be likely to innovate solutions to new problems. In this experiment, a scorpion is served to a meerkat in a modified lunchbox. To get to the snack, its instinct is to try and take route one through the clear plastic walls. But some meerkats can learn to put aside that instinct and take a different approach. There's another way in. Turn the lid. In fact, the individuals that were likely to solve them were low-ranking subordinate um, individuals, and particularly male. Dominant individuals are able to get food by stealing, so they don't need to innovate. It's the low-ranking individuals that need to innovate because essentially necessity is the mother of invention. And especially the males, because it's the males who will leave their natal group to go and look for breeding opportunities elsewhere, so they're really going to face hardship when they leave. And it pays for them to try and figure out new ways of getting food. In the desert, a meerkat has to be very inventive and eat just about anything it can get its paws on. Millipedes, lizards, sand frogs and even snakes are all on the menu. If a meerkat had a choice, it would go for a scorpion every time. It has a nasty sting and tough claws, but it's packed full of protein. Over time, the meerkats have worked out exactly how to take them on. Where to hold them down. Where to crunch. To Squirt, it looks like a game, and he wants to join in. But not yet. Alex was fascinated by how quickly meerkats learned to solve quite tricky problems. Over the years, various studies suggested that the young of some species are taught problem solving by adults. But it had never been clearly demonstrated. If it could be proved with meerkats, it would mean that meerkats could do something that, at the time, had only ever been observed in one other mammal. Humans. Squirt and Weenie need to learn how to kill a scorpion for themselves. So the older helpers are going to teach them. The first step is for the teacher to remove the sting and then leave them to tackle a live but harmless scorpion. When they can handle that, the next step is to teach them how to bite the sting off a live scorpion for themselves. At the time it was an important discovery because it was the first evidence that wild animals do teach. It was commonly thought that teaching was something that happened only in human societies. So by finding evidence for teaching in meerkats we could begin to start to piece together a puzzle of how teaching might have evolved so we were able to look at how the meerkats teach. Now that Alex has pieced this together, he began to look at another intriguing aspect of meerkat behavior. Just like us, they have different levels of enthusiasm about leaping out of bed in the morning. It's not just the parents who struggle to get their pups out of the burrow. For whole families, there's a tradition of early rising or having a lion that never changes, even over years. 
and it's passed down from generation to generation. Over a period of more than a decade, we find that one neighbouring group will get up late, another neighbouring group will get up early, and in fact we can almost set our alarm clocks by it. So just as you don't have afternoon tea in France, but you do in England, the meerkats show specific traditions to their groups. Once he had discovered one tradition amongst meerkats, he wanted to see if other traditions could be passed from individual to individual. So he devised an experiment to test this. He wanted to know if a meerkat could recognize a shape for a reward, and if other meerkats could learn to follow this new tradition. So what we did is that in some groups of meerkats, we trained one individual, who we call the demonstrator, out of sight of everybody else, to approach one of the letters but not the other. Each letter has the reward of egg crumbs buried in the sand next to it, with an alternative choice of water if they want it. The demonstrator is taught to go to the letter Y to find his treat. What Alex found was that when other untrained meerkats first arrived, they ignored their own natural instincts to dig up food where they could smell it. Instead, they followed the lead of the first meerkat towards the letter Y, establishing a new tradition by social learning. Just like a fad for a new nightclub or restaurant, the letter Y soon becomes the place to be. It's the worst drought of the decade, and the Kung Fu are in the middle of it. Almost no rain for 12 months. Pups Squirt and Weenie are nearly three months old. In the parched earth, there's little food to dig for. The family are growing thin. Strong winds sweep across the stricken land. As they surge over the Kalahari, they whip up huge dust storms. are nervous. They're disorientated and lose touch with each other. The storm sends them fleeing in all directions. The storm finally passes, but in the chaos, the group has become split up. They are desperate to find each other. Eventually, Clinky comes across one of her pups. It's Squirt, but his brother Weenie is missing. Clinky spots another group. Are they rivals? She doesn't quite know whether to lead her diminished family into battle or to flee. But as they come closer, they recognize each other. It's the rest of their family. Squirt and Weenie are reunited.
The Kung Fu have survived the worst drought for 10 years. Squirt and Weenie are learning how to look after themselves. And Clinky has all her family around her. As they rest at sunset, they're through the worst. The pups are now successfully through their most vulnerable stage. And together again as a big group, they're better placed than most to survive whatever challenges are set to come their way. <laughs> Today, millions of people know and love these mere cats. <laughs> Just me. <laughs> <laughs> But their superstar status only came about because of the patience and perseverance of Tim and his team. Every time I come back to the Kalahari after a time away, it always strikes me as a magical experience to be accepted into the middle of a group of animals like this so that you can watch them going about their normal behavior, their natural lives. And at this distance, you can see things going on that you'd never see if you were sitting a hundred meters away. During the past two decades, their observations have led us to understand some remarkable truths about meerkats. Not just how they cooperate, but the personality of each individual member. In this harsh and challenging environment, individuals cannot make it on their own. For meerkats, finding enough to eat and raising pups is the work of many. And because meerkats mate for life, their helpers are their own children. The kids are helping to raise their full brothers and sisters. sense for families to stick together and to cooperate because in the harsh Kalahari it's cooperate or die. Oh.